morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone this morning to Bethany Lutheran. We are in the order of service on page 26, service of word and sacrament, and uh, we are now in the sixth Sunday of Pentecost. We ask that the Lord would richly bless our worship this morning as we open with the first singing of our posted hymn. <laughs> Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. 
Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. O Lord. joys beyond understanding for those who love you. Pour into our hearts such love for you, that loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated as we hear the Word of God. The Word of God today is a reminder to all of us about the cost of discipleship and how it can even divide house and home, families and siblings, parents and children. If we're either for Christ or against Christ, that dividing sword will pierce those homes and uh, the cost can be costly as Jesus reminds us today. Our Old Testament lesson is from the writings of Moses in the book of Exodus, beginning at chapter 32, verse 15. Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. The tablets were the work of God. 
The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people shouting, he said to Moses, There is the sound of war in the camp. Moses replied, It is not the sound of victory. It is not the sound of defeat. It is the sound of singing that I hear. When Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf the people had made and burned it in the fire. Then he ground it to powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. He said to Aaron, what did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? Do not be angry, my lord, Aaron answered. You know how prone these people are to evil. They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the gold, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Moses saw that the people were running wild and that Aaron had let them get out of control and so become a laughingstock to their enemies. So he stood at the entrance to the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Each man strap a sword to his side, go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother and friend and neighbor. The Levites did as Moses commanded, and that day about 3,000 of the people died. Then Moses said, You have been set apart to the Lord today, for you are against your own sons and brothers, and he has blessed you this day. Here ends our Old Testament lesson. We continue with the psalm of the day, which is before us and up there, Psalm 89, and we'll sing the song responsibly by the half verse. We'll join together in the refrain and the glory be.
scripture lesson is from John's first epistle, reading from chapter 2, beginning at verse 15. Do not love the world, or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Here ends our second scripture lesson, Alleluia. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Alleluia. of our Lord. The gospel chosen for Pentecost 6 is recorded for us in St. Matthew's account, reading from the 10th chapter, beginning at verse 34. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
our Father and from the Lord our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I read the lesson from the Gospel that will serve as our meditation today from Matthew 10, 34 to 42. I'd like to reread verse 38. Jesus said, Anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. These are the words of our text. A few years back, a 27-year-old woman, Sudanese woman by the name of Miriam Ibrahim, was in prison for her faith in Jesus Christ. It made national headlines and news. You see, her father was a Muslim, and under Sharia law, the law of the land, a convert to the Christian faith is punishable by death. They treated Miriam worse than an animal, She and her husband, prior to being put in prison, had conceived, and she was forced to give birth on a prison floor, and they didn't even have the decency to unchain her legs. I wonder if Miriam Ibrahim had difficulty understanding the words of Jesus today. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Probably not. In fact, I wonder if we have a little bit more difficult time living in America, American Christians understanding persecution. I wonder if we have more difficulty with these words of Jesus than someone like Miriam Ibrahim. While we could say we're incredibly blessed in this country for the freedoms we have, with freedom comes responsibility because freedoms, as you all know, can quickly turn into curses. When the American Christian's idea of persecution is to show up at church on Sunday morning only to find that their seat is taken, you know we've been spoiled for many years. Or if we have to fight through a hymn that the preacher picked that we maybe don't like very much, friends, that's not persecution. Martin Luther, the man after our church body, he's the one who coined this theme of our sermon today in Latin, and if uh, you could kind of make out the English words in the uh, Latin phrase there, nulla persecutio, as tota persecutio, simply means no persecution is total persecution. Now, mind you, he said this while having a bounty on his own head that under the law of the land he could be hunted down and killed. So when he spoke this, perhaps he was speaking prophetically to our time period. You see, Luther knows, as even you and I know, that if we have nothing to stand up and confess, the temptation is to sit down and remain silent and bury our confession. Years ago, they did a study on trees trying to reproduce them in in a controlled environment inside of a large building so that they could study further how trees have such incredible strength. The building roof was made of glass so that it could receive sunlight. It had all the soil, the nutrients, the water that it needed that was out in the environment. And these trees grew and they fell down. They studied trees out in the wild and discovered that was the difference was that the, at, the, at, the, at the trunk, at the very base of the trunk, as these little saplings have undergone hurricane force winds in some environments, these little saplings developed what they called stress wood at the base of the trunk so that they would become incredibly strong and able to sustain themselves. If you've ever been to New Orleans and did a little sightseeing in the Garden District, it's beautiful, isn't it? Those live oak trees that make sort of like a tunnel through the street that you drive down and the arms or the branches are as large as a pretty nice sized oak tree themselves. And yet one sits back in awe of God's creation. How did it happen? How can all these branches that weigh so much be sustained by just one trunk. Well, it's that stress wood that God implemented in the creation of trees to be able to sustain themselves. When Martin Luther said no persecution is total persecution, he knows 
we all know how quickly a Christian faith can become volatile, how quickly a Christian faith can become fickle. I love the environment. God created the environment and we should protect it and love it. But when a church decides, not our church, to go to styrofoam cups, which is bad for the environment, and no longer ceramic, and someone throws up their arms and says, I can't worship with these heathens any longer. They walk away in a fit of rage because they went to styrofoam. You know such a faith is a fickle and volatile faith. When somebody's more concerned about the paint colors and bathrooms, you can fill in your own scenario if you'd like. Such a faith is fickle. And it's fickle to Jesus Christ who says, unless you take up your cross and follow me, you ain't worthy of me. Paint colors and styrofoam cups and meaningless changes in the church, those aren't crosses, dear friends. You want a cross? The cross is an instrument of embarrassment. That's why they gave people the cross in Roman days. They publicly embarrassed them. They oftentimes crucified them naked so that people would walk by and look at the disgusting body that's been stretched out. It's an instrument of shame and torture and death. And Jesus says, when you take up your cross and testify to the truth of my word, that cross is coming. And if a person's more concerned about a styrofoam cup than a soul that is dying in their own household, such a faith is fickle and volatile and ready to crumble at any moment. The cross isn't for the weak and the immature, for the lazy, for the indifferent. Jesus said anyone who puts his hand to the plow and looks back, he ain't fit for the kingdom of God, not for service. C.S. Lewis, the late C.S. Lewis, great theologian, he was once an atheist, philosopher, writer, author, poet, he did it all. He was like the Martin Luther of the Anglican Church. He once said this, if you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. His name was Tom and our routine was simple. Tom was an 85-year-old widower. This was our routine twice a month. On Friday at 11 a.m., I'd go to Tom's house and we'd watch Madlock. 12 p.m., we'd go out for catfish and hush puppies and a bowl of gumbo. Then we'd go see Tom's son, who was mentally ill, in an institution. Tom was raised in the Lutheran Church. He was a strong Christian. He was not one of those bruised wheat reeds. He was not a, a smoldering wick that was ready to go out. He was raised in the church. He was baptized. He was confirmed. He served on councils and committees. And they asked him to serve as building chairman. A rather thankless job at times. They built a church, but it came at a cost. People told not only him, but his wife and children what they really thought about the building. The congregation was somewhat divided. They wrote letters to his family, and Tom said, the hell with the church and the hell with God's people in that church. And for 30 years, Tom sat at home while mom and children went to church each week. Wanted nothing to do with it. His wife became terminally ill. And she said, I have one dying wish for you. I've been praying for you for 30 years, Tom. This is my dying wish in this life, and that is that I see you in the next life. It's time to set aside the anger, put it away, and come back home. Tom did. He listened to his wife. She died, and this was now our routine. 
came time for Tom to die, and I said, Tom, you got any last regrets before you leave? I said, yeah, I got one. The 30 years of anger. Seemed kind of silly when you get ready to die. I said, you know what, Tom? You dropped your cross for a long time. Christ told you to pick it up and follow after him, and you dropped it. But he didn't. And his cross was much more difficult than yours, Tom. You see, the road to Calvary was a long, dusty, dry road. And you think it was bad to get letters from members? Imagine your own church running away from you, one of them selling you out for 30 pieces of silver, one of them swearing he doesn't know you when you thought he was your good friend. Imagine your own Jewish people there standing before the cross looking at you like you're an impotent weakling even though you're the creator of the heavens and the earth and you can strike every one of them dead by just thinking it in your mind. They mocked and scorned the Son of God. They said he saved others but he can't even save himself. Oh, he could, Tom. But he wouldn't. He bore the cross that you dropped, Tom. But he did it because he loved you. And somebody had to forgive your sins. You know, when you and I step back and we look at life a little bit and do an honest evaluation, maybe you thought your faith was about this thick. Come to find out it was pretty shallow. When we look at the things that we grumble and complain about and we see people like Miriam Ibrahim, we wonder to ourselves, how does God get any of us to heaven? It's not just the Israelites complaining in the wilderness. It's the church. It always has been. When God invites us to take the cross, we say, hey, let him take it. I want nothing to do with that. I want the comfortable street that leads to heaven. How in the world does God get any of us home to heaven? Well, we've dropped our cross so many times. Well, heaven, you see, is not dependent on the cross we wear, is it? Thank God for that, or none of us would be going home. You see, forgiveness was dispensed on his cross with his blood. And salvation was given away to the entire world through the cross that Jesus Christ bore on his back. God achieved all the glory he needs to achieve in you through him. And so this begs one last question before us today, doesn't it? If the cross is given all the glory through Jesus' cross, why in the world should we take up ours if what comes as a consequence is division in the home, maybe? Hard feelings, embarrassment? Maybe life and limb. Why would we take that cross if his is the one that grants us forgiveness and life everlasting? Well, the answer is simple. Like my good friend Tom, Christ doesn't want you and me to forfeit what he freely gave to each of us. And he knows better than anyone that a fickle faith is in danger of Losing faith. And so he commands us, dear friends, to graciously take this instrument of torture and see it as an instrument of blessing. It is a badge of honor, you see. And so we ask the likes of Miriam Ibrahim. We ask her, Miriam, was the cross worth it for you? Not knowing whether you and your conceived child were going to die a horrifying death. Was it worth it to have division in your home? To have your father abandon you? Your government betray you? And live as an exile for the rest of your earthly life? Was it all worth it to you, Miriam? I'm certain her answer would be what? It was. And it is. But you know what? Her cross didn't bring her one inch closer to God. It's not what gave her forgiveness or salvation. 
It's because she had forgiveness and had salvation that she bore her cross and did so graciously and became an inspiration to billions of Christians across this world who watched and said, Miriam, are you going to cave or are you going to confess Christ? What are you going to do? And we know what she did. She confessed Christ. And now it's your turn. Now it's our turn to make bold and faithful and honest proclamation to the entire will of God. Come what may. Knowing that it might divide some of our own offspring. Have the conversation. Don't stop having conversations. Don't stop praying for your loved ones. Tell them to come home. Tell them where to find forgiveness and salvation dispensed. It is through God's word. It is through the sacrament of Holy Communion. Don't stop praying, dear friends. Everyone that God has placed in your circle of friends are placed there for a reason. Whether you work with them or socialize with them, they are there for a reason. Tell them what the cross means to you. Tell them how it fixed your broken relationship between you and God. Tell them. Come what may. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may it guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Jesus. Amen. Let us now join in confessing our common faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated.
Gracious God and Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand, the beauties of creation and the bounties of the earth, the joy of life and the pleasure of friendship, the good of work and the gift of rest, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow with one another. Above all, we praise and thank you for your saving word and for your son's body and blood which you give us to eat and to drink in the sacrament. Through these means of grace, you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts and unite us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church on earth. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage and grow careless in our watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace and move us to use the gifts that you give us to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember in mercy those who are sick and suffering and bring your healing to troubled homes and lives. Now, eternal God and Father, keep us in the saving faith and so enable us to overcome all things through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He made his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same manner that he also took the cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this whenever you drink of it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
May this eating and drinking of the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior may strengthen and nourish you in the one true faith, both now and until everlasting life. Go in peace, confident in Jesus. Your sin is paid in full. Be part of
have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. for this last hymn, we're going to be seated for the first two verses. Then we're going to stand for the third verse, okay? Please be seated. 